Thank the choir for singing uh, double duty today, the kids for leading us in the procession and then for singing again. Uh, while we are making announcements, that piece that we just shared with you is uh, part of the cantata that we'll share here on Good Friday evening. And I have to admit there are lots of times that we do things that they're okay. You know, they're, they're nothing wrong and we can say that's a good thing to do. This is way better than okay. Uh, it is a, a beautiful rendering of music in, set in a, a fresh, I think, in a very pleasant way. It's not overly long. Sometimes uh, they're good, but they go on a bit. This one is, I think, well-paced. And I think it will be very meaningful because it's something we have not done in the time I've been here. It's a tenebrae service where we remember that just as we celebrate at Christmas, the light comes into the world. As we move to the crucifixion and the death of Jesus, the light for at least a moment goes out of the world. And there is the intentional darkening of the room and the, the extinguishing of candles. I think you'll find it to be very meaningful. That's Friday evening here at 7 o'clock. You may have a schedule you can't change. It's possible that's true. If you do have flexibility in your schedule, I really encourage you, uh, move whatever you must in your schedule in life that you might be with us in that evening service. We are going to read today once again from the familiar passage for this season, and it's made even more familiar because we've already heard from it and read from it together as our gospel. Nonetheless, I will read again and ask if you are willing and able, will you stand for the reading of the gospel? Reading today from St. Luke, the gospel is found in, as we number them, chapter 19, verse 28 through verse 40. As you hear the words, remember this is the word of the Lord. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it, just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. The word of God for the people of God. As you are seated, will you also once again join me in bowing in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the gift of prayer. Anytime, anywhere, any circumstance, we can turn to you knowing that if we are open and honest, you are gathered to hear and to, to receive our prayer. We pray that today on this Sunday that is just another Sunday. And yet it recalls for us a very particular time. So Lord, we pray that this is not just another Sunday, but for each of us in this room, it is a particular time. A time in which we consider again our own willingness to make Christ Lord and Savior, to recognize him as the King of Kings forgiving us for those fails in the past. We pray now, Lord, you'd strengthen us to your future. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the kingdom of God is a real thing. The kingdom of God is real, and the kingdom of God will be fulfilled. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. The kingdom has come. The kingdom is coming. The kingdom will come. These are the words of Scripture. This is, not, this is not any kind of speculation. God has promised that the day will come. Jesus prayed it in the prayer that we pray so often, Thy kingdom come. It will. 
There's no question of that. It has come. It is coming. It will come. The question isn't not whether or not it's coming. The question is, in what relationship will we be and others be to the kingdom when it comes in its fullness? Now, the Lord may return any time. In fact, every time you read the papers, another horror. You wonder, how long can God abide all the difficult things that the world offers to God's people? So you wonder whether Christ might not return very soon. I don't know. But what I do know is you take your age and then subtract, well, let's be bold, let's say subtract 90 from your age and take the difference. That's about how soon the kingdom's going to come for you. You get my meaning? You're not going to live forever in this world. None of us will. Rich Nickel, who passed just this week, Rich said a few weeks ago, he said, I'm not in a hurry to leave, but I'm ready to leave. His faith was so robust, so thankful for his witness, how he spoke to those around him, those who cared for him, how he spoke to his family, how he spoke to his pastors about his impending departure into the fullness of God's kingdom. God's kingdom will come. And there was a day in Jerusalem when it looked like maybe that moment had come. How many of the Gospels tell the story of the Good Samaritan? You know the Good Samaritan story? You're familiar with the details? How many of the Gospels tell that story? One. Luke. In that same section, Luke tells another story that's only found one place. You know the prodigal son? Well known, yes? Only found one place in the Gospels. The Beatitudes, those eight things, blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who grieve or sorrow. You know how many places in the Bible the Beatitudes are found? Two. In their full version, in Matthew's gospel, and in a lesser degree, in Luke's gospel. How about the Lord's Prayer, central to every version of Christian faith, every tradition of faith? How many gospels teach us the Lord's Prayer? How many? Two. Matthew and Luke. This is even more interesting. Christmas. Christmas story. How many stories tell us about the birth of Jesus? How many of those Gospels tell the record? Two. In fact, John and Mark make no mention of it at all. And Matthew and Luke don't all agree on all the details. or They don't share all the details. Only Luke tells us about the shepherds and the angels, and only Matthew tells us about the visit of the Magi and the political overtones. You know the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. How many Gospels tell the story? All four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There are very few incidents in the Gospel that find the, a place in all four Gospels. Why is that? Why do all the Gospel writers tell this story? Because God's promises and prophecies will all come true. You know, Jesus said that. He said, not one spot of the law will be left out. Everything that God has promised will be proclaimed. And do you know that there is a, a scripture that tells us about the, the entrance into Jerusalem of the promised one? I'll read it to you in just a moment. Because it was a day in the life of Jesus when it seemed like all these things were coming together. The disciples sensed that the crowd seemed to be picking up on the theme. Think about it. Often Jesus had kind of pushed back from being identified as, as the Messiah. You aware of that progression? That often Jesus did something remarkable. He would heal someone or feed people or care for them in a special way. And then he would say, now don't tell anyone. In fact... When he was up on the Mount of Transfiguration with his closest disciples, that was a, a stellar moment of some sort, and Jesus turned to them and said, Now don't speak of this yet. It is not time. But on this day, on this day, Jesus not only agrees to being recognized, the Scripture tells us as it begins, he went on ahead of them. We get the impression that Jesus coming up from Jericho, by the way, which when we say come up, they mean come up. Jericho is about uh, 800 feet below sea level. And Jerusalem's about 2,400 feet above sea level. So when you say you come up, they were coming up. 
They made their way through Jericho along the same road where Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. And as they come near to Bethphage and Bethany, Jesus goes on ahead. He must have made some arrangements there. We hear a little bit about it. You know, his disciples were beginning to hear where they were headed, and they had hopes that this was kind of be the culmination where Jesus would become the ruler that they all hoped the Messiah would be. When Jesus began to say things like, it's not going to be like that, the Son of Man will suffer, he will there be put to death. His disciples balked at that. Peter said, Lord, that will never happen to you. Remember that incident? What did Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. You're thinking of worldly things. This is God's purpose and plan. You know that God's purposes will be fulfilled. Now, you might not agree with them. You may say, that's not the way it should be. That's what Peter said. Let me remind you, Scripture said, God's ways are not our ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so high are God's thoughts above ours. We are pretty puny in our capacities to understand the creation and the purposes of God compared to God's all complete, complete knowing in every way aware of everything God has promised. All we can do at times is say, if you say so, Lord. These disciples were on their way up to Jerusalem. They were frightened. They were confused. They wouldn't even ask any more questions. Go into the village ahead of you, Jesus said, and when you enter it, you will find there a colt tied that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it to me. And then this strange little phrase, and if they ask you what you're doing, you give them this answer. The Lord has need of it. You know, there's almost a little subterfuge here. It's as if Jesus said, we're getting ready for what will be a very public demonstration. There was obviously work behind the scenes. And now it's all coming together. Jesus acts overtly. Then they brought it to Jesus, and after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And then Jesus leads the procession down the Mount of Olives to the delight of the Passover crowds. It was a deliberate act. It was promised in Scripture. You know God's purposes will be fulfilled. God's kingdom will come. Zechariah, long before, ninth chapter, verses 9 and 10, said this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation. Listen to this. Gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Why did Jesus do this? Why do all the gospel writers tell this story? Because it was part of what God said would take place before the fulfillment of God's kingdom. It went on to say, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. He will rule with, to the extent from sea to sea, from river to the ends of the earth. I can't imagine what it was like to be in Jerusalem at Passover. That's one of the things I'd love to do. I would love to be in Bethlehem on Christmas Eve, and I would love to be in Jerusalem over Passover just to see. Have you ever been to a big crowded event someplace in a big metropolitan city, some big celebration, World's Fair perhaps, uh, some kind of other grand where people come from all over and they just kind of inundate a place? The closest I ever came to that was Boston. I've been in Boston three times for the Boston Marathon. And it was crazy. It was I mean, I'd run marathon. I ran one up in God's country in Potter County, and if you saw five people and two deer, you were doing good. <laughs> but when you're at Boston, the whole course, the whole way is lined with people, and at certain places, they're eight, 10, 12 people deep. Wellesley College, do you know about Wellesley College? They're famous. They happen to be just at the halfway point in the marathon. You've run 13 miles and you have 13 miles to go. And my first year, I didn't know about Wellesley College. And I began to approach Wellesley. I was at about mile 12 and a half, chugging along. And I hear this noise and I thought, what is that racket? Well, in those days, and maybe it still is, it was an all-girls school, an all-women's school. They have a tradition there of coming out to support the marathon. Well, they, they back up about eight rows deep and they, they rotate. So the ones in the front are yelling and screaming at the top of their lungs. And as they wear out, the next wave steps forward. When you get there, it's an unbelievable noise. And you think, oh. You kind of float for about a quarter of a mile. These beautiful young women cheering you on. By the second year I went to Boston, I was looking for it. Painful to the ear, it was so loud, but lifting to the spirit. 
I can't imagine what Jerusalem was like when people gathered for Passover and on this particular day, a lot of things came together. Some people would have known about Jesus, other might have been totally in the dark, but almost everyone would have recognized the symbolism of a teacher, quote, sent from God, entering down over the Mount of Olives, riding on a, a young donkey. And people throwing their coats before him and cutting branches, if you read the other gospel records, and waving them and saying, Hosanna, even though it's not found here in Luke's rendering. There was a great ruckus celebrating that all these things finally had come together. The promised one was finally here. The kingdom of God would come upon the earth, would it not? Well, the disciples were hoping so. You know, if you read just a little bit earlier, you found that two of Jesus' closest friends, James and John, came to Jesus in a quiet moment found in Mark 10, and they said, Lord, when you enter into your glory, we have a question, we have a request, we have a favor. And Jesus said, what is it? When you're in your glory, we want to sit one on your left and one on your right. They were so expectant that this might be the moment when all this would come to pass at this Passover, that they were jockeying for position of power and authority. It was all coming together, coming to a head, or at least so it seemed. You've heard the story I'm about to tell before, if you've been around here for any length of time. And I tell it pretty often in different settings, but now is the time because it is the heart of Palm Sunday, it is the heart of Holy Week, it is the, the heart of the passion of Christ. You know, if I, if I had the power, and I don't have much influence, but if I had the power to tell you what to do, what was that word last week? You remember what my title was supposed to be? <laughs> if you weren't here last week, that's a bad joke anyway. Uh, Extravagant holiness. I, I want you to address me that way. I think that has... No, don't. A lot of you had variations on the theme. If I were your extravagant holiness, and if I could say it and you would do it, I would say don't miss what will happen here this week during Holy Week. Because you cannot go from Palm Sunday to Easter unless you travel through the events of Jesus' life. And I mean travel through them to both appreciate them, understand them, accept them, and then allow them to have their effect in your life because they were certainly the pivotal moments in what Jesus came to this world to do. You know, the, our brothers and sisters in the Roman faith have a phrase. It's called a holy day of obligation. I think being here today, I think every Sunday is a holy day of obligation. But I think this week you should be here for Maundy Thursday right here in this room at 7 o'clock when we remember the Last Supper. You should be here at noon if your schedule will permit that to read the passion of what happened to Jesus when that day came. You should be here in the afternoon. What would the community think if 400 of us showed up downtown walking around praying for the businesses? And you're thinking, well, I don't do that. My question to you is why not? It's an opportunity to say, we believe that this is a pivotal moment in the life of humanity. It is a pivotal moment of each person who makes the decision to be a follower of Jesus. Holy Week's schedule then culminates for us on Good Friday evening, and I've already asked you to come and be a part of the Tenebrae service, a community service for whom the whole community, I hope, would come. I hope we are packed to overflowing as the choir will lead us in beautiful music. Right here there will be a violin, then there's a cello, and then there's an oboe, and then there is a flute. And there is a pianist and a pianist as we will go through passages of Scripture set to beautiful music. Why? Because God's kingdom is coming. God's kingdom has come. God's kingdom will come. The story I promised that I say often over the years and have shared many times. It is the story of a woman who went into a jewelry store, and it was told to me for true many, many years ago. I don't know if it is, but I believe it certainly could be. The story was told that it was in San Francisco, not that that matters. It could happen anywhere. A woman walked into the jewelry store and said, I'm interested in buying a cross to wear on a necklace. And the young man behind the counter said, oh, I can help you with that. We have lots of crosses. 
And so he started at the one end with the very plain, very simple, made out of simple materials and said, these are available at such a price. And then you want to go a little bigger or you want a little bit of better quality. And they were showing clear down where they had them with very precious metals, beautifully crafted with gems inset. But he said, now before we go any further, I need to have one point of clarification. Are you interested in a plain cross or one with the little man on it? That is the heart of Holy Week. You know, Scripture talks about, is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? My guess is that day in Jerusalem, there were lots and lots of people who were not there. They were doing what they did. They were just involved in their business. They were involved in their life. They were getting ready for Passover. There might have been a big parade. I don't like big parades. Do you? I try to stay. I've never been to the St. Patrick's Day in Pittsburgh. The Ocampas don't go there. I don't like big crowds, but that day there was a big crowd. My guess is there were lots of Ocampas in Jerusalem that weren't at the celebration. But what happened that week takes us all in because either it's a little man on the cross or it is the Son of God who dies in our stead. And that is the pivotal difference. What happened in Holy Week is not something that we can set aside. We are all going to be present. It is a holy day of obligation beyond any other. Either we recognize that God's Son has come to lay down His life or we do, as Scripture says, we pass by. Thy kingdom come. God's way of salvation was being played out that day in Jerusalem, not in the way that many would have chosen. They were hoping for a political resolution. They were hoping for the power that would be resident in one who would deliver them from all their worldly ills. God would send a deliverer, the Messiah. God's kingdom would be established. That day long ago, it looked like that was going to happen that day, and it did, but not in the way that they might expect. It was not military, it was not political, it was not by power and domination, but it was humble obedience to the will of God. Jesus came to pay the price for the sin of the world. He came to suffer and die in our place. Is that nothing to all of you who pass by? The triumphal entry invites us to re-examine our understanding of the mission of Jesus. It is the day in which it became clear. Jesus said, yes, this is who I am. This is why I am here. For a change, he didn't say, don't tell anyone. For a change, he allowed them to lay their cloaks on the road. He led the procession, and people shouted and proclaimed what God had proclaimed before, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. But even then there was reluctance and resistance. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. The day had come for the recognition of who Jesus is and what his purpose is. The day had come for Jesus to know, and had the crowds not responded as they should, the very stones would have said, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Nothing can stop what Jesus once prayed with his disciples, what untold believers have prayed ever since, even to this very hour, thy kingdom come, thy kingdom will come. There's no question of this. God's kingdom has come. God's kingdom is coming. It began that day in a very specific way with a very specific act when Jesus said God's purposes are being fulfilled. Holy Week is central to that understanding. It is the central act in the coming of God's kingdom. God has come to us. God has shared God's purpose and love with us. And God in Christ Jesus has paid the price for our sinfulness, the sins of the world. Again, we understand the truth. The kingdom will come. God's promises will be fulfilled. The only question is, in what relationship will we be? In what relationship will others that we love and care about be when that day comes? Pray with me. We thank you, Lord, for the reminder of Scripture that rotates around every year, and once again we wrestle with it. 
that moment when everything seemed to be the celebration of the fulfillment of your kingdom. And then we are taught again the unbelievable lesson of obedience, that he who knew no sin took upon himself the sin of the whole world so that our sin might be lifted. Lord, today we pray you would find us humbly obedient that we have confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior. And that now we understand the importance of allowing that Christ to rule in our lives so that our life will reflect all that Christ has given and that we might be a witness and an invitation to the others. We pray that in this Palm Sunday celebration. We pray that your kingdom come. In Jesus' name, amen.